In this video, I'm going to start off with terminology, but then I'm also going to talk a little bit about prepping images for the web and some things you might want to take into consideration. Now, normally I also include a document here in case you want kind of a listening guide helper here, but overall, um, really you'll be fine if you don't want to take notes. I just put it here in case for those that like to take notes while they're listening. I am going to be jumping around in the document a little bit, uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So the first item that I actually want to talk about, it's a little further down here. Oops, it's a little bit too thick for me there. Where's my pencil? There is my pencil there, and it's just a little bit too... There we go. Is the idea of a pixel. This might seem like a silly topic to start off with, but this is kind of our main measurements that we use in any form of digital design. Now, this can be a tricky thing because if you think about it, whenever you're working in print, for instance, you're designing in a pixel-based environment, but you're going to be printing to a inches-based environment, or if you're using picas, etc. However, with the web, we go, and this is our core measurement. We use this for things such as, you know, screen resolutions, Also, camera raw images, and a slew of other things. So the pixel stays the same. Really, it is just a little box that we measure one by one. If you've ever zoomed in too far on an image and you started to see kind of this blockiness or what we call the jaggies, what you were actually seeing was the pixels. And more specifically, what you were seeing was the computer was trying to make up for the amount of pixels there. Now, using pixels and going a little bit further with that concept here, this actually gets us into the other side of things that I just mentioned. Is screen resolutions. For those that are new to web design, this can actually be a little bit tricky to wrap your head around. One of the biggest drawbacks of screen resolutions, and I'll put a little frowny face here, is that we cannot control this. Let's say that I have a sample size of my target audience of over 1,000 people. I am assuming my target audience, I'm going to have 1,000 users. But this is where things get tricky. Of those users, I know maybe 200 of them will be using a desktop computer. Great. However, I also know that maybe the other 800 will sooner access the website through a mobile app or a mobile device. Okay, now we're starting to get a little trickier here. So that's one of the issues that we have to take into consideration. And there are what we call web frameworks that can help us with this. Back in the olden days, we actually had to kind of make multiple versions of a website to take into consideration regarding screen resolutions. Because what could happen is, is let's say, let's go back now and I'll choose, let me choose a different color here for folks. We'll go to the reds. Of these 200 users using a desktop, maybe 50 of these users are still using uh, probably, I think our low end at this point still is like a 1280 by 1024 screen resolution. So that's not even really widescreen there. Meanwhile, you might have 150 other users within that sample group that are using uh, 1660 by 900 for a screen resolution. 
So all of these users, you want them to have the same usable experience in a well-designed website. So that's a lot to think about as a web designer versus like if we go back to print, for instance, eight and a half by 11 is eight and a half by 11. It doesn't change. So somebody can turn it in their hands, look at, looking at it horizontally. They can flip it upside down uh, into a, an upside down portrait. Those are about the amount of changes they can make with that. Web, on the other hand, we have all of these different resolutions that we have to play with. So that's where screen resolutions really come into play and kind of actually are one of the prime elements here that make us stem off, and I'll bring this over here, as far as the idea of image preparations for the web. Now, in a previous lecture, if you recall, I talked about, you know, kind of your three types here. You have the JPEGs that are capable of handling thousands upon thousands of colors. You have the GIFs that handle less colors but can be animated and have transparent backgrounds. And then you have the PNGs that can also handle lots of colors, also have a transparent background. Now, just as a little bit of background for these three here, one question I have actually gotten in my class is like, well, okay, why don't we see too many GIFs anymore? Well, the reason that we don't see a lot of the GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you were taught to say it, is many, many years ago, uh, there was a company that actually tried to copyright uh, the GIF file extension. And so all of us web developers and designers were like, really? So what ended up happening was another group came out with the PNG and pretty much it did the same, if not more than the GIF. So we all stopped using the GIF and we all shifted to the PNG. Now also the irony of the whole thing was, was a lot of web designers and developers were like, who is going to police the entire internet to make sure, you know, we are not using GIFs. So while it's still around and great for like internet memes and stuff like that, from a professional standpoint, I don't see it used frequently. Normally it's the ping and the JPEG. So those are your three graphics uh, file types there. One other thing just to add into this is I have gotten questions about camera raw as far as whenever you're using photos. Because the files are so large, normally we end up actually having to convert and even downsize to make these web ready. This includes changing as far as the DPI of the graphic or dots per inch, which I'll get into on my next uh, discussion here, and also changing the overall image resolution. The biggest thing when you're prepping an image that I can remind you all of is it is much easier to take away pixels as far as the resolution is concerned than it is to try and add in pixels to the graphic. So the higher the resolution of your original image, the better. It's easier to go through and just get those extras, uh, get those extra uh, pixels in place whenever you first take the photos. So that brings me to the next point here that I wanna talk about here a little bit, and I'm gonna add a new layer and hide this. Is you may often hear folks kind of talk about two primary terms here. And I think that's because of the fact that a lot of designers, both uh, web and print, they kind of cross over with each other. First off is the dots per inch, or you may often hear this referred to as DPI. Dots per inch is focused more in the print environment. Think about in terms of a laser printer and how much ink it's having to add to the environment. So normally for a very high resolution graphic way back in the day, we'd talk about you want it to at least be 300 DPI as far as the print scale was concerned. So this very much hung on the idea of print, which is fine. 
A lot of folks, however, because of kind of the crossover between web and graphics, we also have what is called now pixels per the inch. So now this is strictly focused on a web-based environment. Normally our default back in the day was a 72 PPI, which meant 72 pixels per one real world inch. This was a two factor thing. We had to deal with actual internet speeds I mean, I'm talking like 56K, but also too, it was also easier to download and a lesser quality. We play this lovely game of quality versus download speed when it comes to working with the web. So we want things to download quickly but also too, we wanna have high quality, but not so high a quality that the image can't load, like for example, trying to use our camera raw file, but enough quality that it will make it so that we can actually, you know, it makes the website look good. Just so that you're aware, nowadays we can get away with higher PPI just because of the strength of monitors, video cards, etc. A lot of people will jump to 96 PPI. I've even seen where folks will just go straight on 300 pixels per inch. However, just to emphasize, that doesn't mean that it is exactly the same as the D in dots per inch, but we do have some higher measurements. If you aren't sure of your user base or target audience, there is absolutely nothing wrong with sticking to the 72 PPI screen resolutions there. So those are the two items there as far as so far. We've now talked about PPI and DPI. We talked about our three graphics types and we talked about pixels. I've been touching on screen resolutions and I will get more into those in a bit, but let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the coloring schemes as far as web goes. More specifically, the RGB values down here. So let's go ahead here. We'll draw like a nice little squiggly line here just to separate it. And let's come back in now and we're going to talk about RGB. And I'll actually make this a little bit brighter. So for those who are brand new to design, this means the colors red, green, and blue. These are very similar and are often considered to be an additive color format because we base it, if you think about off of lighting. If you've ever seen in a movie theater or somebody's home uh, video studio there where you pretty much have three primary bulbs. You have a red, a green, and a blue. You force and crank all of those values to 100%, you get white. That's why we call it additive. Different values as far as the strengths of red, green, and blue will give us different colors on the color spectrum. You turn off all the bulbs, there is no color, which gives us black. We use RGB in web design environments for that reason. Monitors are based off of an additive color format. If you think about it, you turn on your monitor, you see the light coming off of it. I mean, we talk about the concerns of blue light. You turn off the monitor, you've turned off the backlighting as far as the monitor's functionality, you have black. This is a little bit different then say, for those of you who are more familiar with print, CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, 
which are kind of in basic printers, your core areas here. Now, one of the biggest questions I often get when we get into web design is, well, can I actually use these interchangeably? To the untrained eye, yes, you can. It's not going to be that big of a deal. However, for those of us who are more familiar with RGB, uh, you are going to be able to tell a difference, especially if you jump from monitor to monitor. So it is a good idea to have, it's great if you have an ad or graphics that are going to go into a print environment with CMYK. You are going to want to do a conversion though into RGB whenever you get to that point. Is it the end of the world if you don't? No, the graphic will do, still display with co the colors um, that are from the photograph or your designed graphic. However, they may just look a little off as far as being in a totally different color environment. This is also one of the issues as far as, again, we talked about over here with the dots per inch versus, you know, the pixels per inch, the PPI. Once again, you're designing in CMYK for print in technically an RGB environment, just like you're designing for dots per inch for a printer for DPI in an environment that thrives with pixels per inch. So we have that kind of disconnect going on there as far as the different color schemes are concerned. Also too, when you're talking about coming back around here to the R, G, and B, these are also, you'll get something called R, G, B, A. The A stands for alpha, or for those of you um, who do design opacity, how see-through something is. When we set up color schemes for the web, we can often set as far as RGBA. So we set the red value, the green, and the blue. This actually then ties into one more thing for those that are interested, which is what we call the hexadecimal value. Hexadecimal is kind of the core backbone of coloring that we have used for years in web design. Hexadecimal values measure on a scale from zero through nine, lowercase a, I believe it's to F, and then capital A through F. And you have six slots. So normally we start off with a pound symbol And then you have these slots for all of these numerical and alphanumeric numbers. Just so you are aware, what these are actually standing for is you need to think about them in terms of twos, where each of these values represent R, G, and B. So there is a method to the madness when we talk about hexadecimal, because hexadecimal ties back into the concept of the RGB values. Oftentimes, if you see any design briefs, especially when it comes to the web, you will either see something like an RGBA color declaration or a hexadecimal declaration. What's nice about those is no matter how the monitor is calibrated, the color is going to be the same. I normally use the example of think about restaurants. McDonald's has a specific shade of yellow and red that they use. Likewise, so does Subway. They have a specific color of green. So often in a design brief, what you may see is a hexadecimal value, for example, using Subway or even Twitter, where they have that value set for the designer. So you use that hexadecimal value if you're doing anything web related. Likewise as well, they will also probably have some sort of CMYK in there as well, so that for those that are doing print media, you have that there as well. So that's kind of the core elements there. Now, last thing to talk about a little bit is screen resolution. That's the one thing on our document here really didn't get into as far as testing and looking at items. And what I'd like to do here is I'd like to bring up Dreamweaver just real, real quick, just to show you here, as far as measuring and working with different screen resolutions. And let me go ahead here, Whoop. kind of hanging here. There we go. Okay, there is one other way that you can do some testing. 
and that's down in this lower corner here as far as your previewing is concerned. In previous videos, I've used the preview button here with the little web browser so that we could check out what our website looks like in different browsers. What we haven't looked at though is right next to it as far as notice it actually has specific layouts for different types of handheld devices, which is really, really important for us. So like for instance, if I do the iPhone here, notice what it does for me here. Notice it's making an iPhone 7, so I can scroll and actually see what my website will look like when I'm viewing it on an iPhone. So again, I can click on these and just go through and preview as I see fit. And that's one of the most important things with screen resolutions and one of the big hiccups I'll often see for folks who are new to designing in web and using Dreamweaver is, for me, as you all can see, I have a very, very wide screen monitor. Most people do not have the curved wide screens. So it's a very important thing for me as a designer to take into consideration that I'm sitting there looking at, okay, well, let's see what it looks like on an iPad. So now I can kind of see as far as the layout goes, I've got plenty of space in there as far as the design goes. So I'm not gonna be surprised while working in full size and then I take it into say a web browser or I preview it as one of these devices and now all of a sudden my web layout doesn't look the way I thought it would. So just keep that in mind as far as the resolutions go. Uh, that's another topic that as we keep working with Dreamweaver and its WYSIWYG elements, we will be taking a look at. Uh, there is a framework called Bootstrap that can actually really help with this layout and making sure that your designs are custom fitted to all different types of screen resolutions. So hopefully this has helped and that's kind of the background as far as different terminologies that you're going to want to be familiar with.